Welcome to the regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee. Today is Thursday, December 19th, 2019. Uh, joining the committee tonight, oh, first of all, uh, Jeff Thielman is uh, not able to meet us on time. He may be joining us late. And joining us tonight are Juliana Keyes from the AEA and Manjo Moore from uh, Arlington High School Student Representative. Uh, doesn't look like we have any public comment. Any, any public comment from the audience? No. All right, so the first item on our agenda is actually um, the approval of the Pathways Academy plan. Um, we have Michelle Gugen, the um, Executive Vice President of McLean Hospital, and Laura Mead to present. Um, please come up to the table, and uh, the microphone doesn't work in the room, but it works at home. This is broadcast on cable TV, okay. so just Thank make you. sure as each of you speak, you move the microphone or keep it in between you. Oh, is the, Karen, is the cord all the way out? The cord looks a little stuck. Thank you. All right, so um, uh, we haven't done this for a long time. We haven't had a new school open in Arlington for a very long time since before I've been here. Um, so if you just want to tell us, give us a little bit of uh, overview of what your program is, uh, what the plan is for its Arlington operations, and uh, we can go from there. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for, for having us this evening. We appreciate you putting this on the agenda. Um, let me just give a quick overview of what um, McLean Services will is the plan to be coming to Arlington, because I think that will, may answer some other questions you, you may have about uh, the school and our other programs. Great. Um, we, we were uh, very fortunate to find that there would be a property like Jermaine Lawrence available to be able to help us expand our services. We, at this point, are oversubscribed, and there is way more good work to be done, and we just have run out of space. So uh, particularly for residential care and the school services, and their campus has been uh, built to, to be able to do that, and that is a big thrill for us because we're in 1890s buildings that were not built for what they now do, and that's always creates a challenge. So the opportunity here is to relocate Pathways Academy, which is why we're here tonight, but also to relocate uh, two areas of residential programs from our three East continuum. These are uh, residential programs that are built around the uh, dialectical behavioral therapy uh, kinds of techniques, which are edu educationally based uh, socio-emotional learning uh, curricula, with classroom uh, types of organizing uh, features for kids with goals, and those children uh, will be on the campus as well. Uh, probably a very important feature of that whole program is all of their educational needs will also be provided by the program. They will not be in the Arlington school system. So I know that was an issue uh, with the previous folks because they, they had different programs. Our programs are all inclusive, and we feel very strongly that the educational needs for these uh, adolescents primarily who will be in our care for about six to eight weeks, we will take care of their educational needs as well in one program right at the center in, at the Jermaine Lawrence campus. So that will be what we'll be offering for them. Um, and we expect this will be in the range of 30 to 40 individuals. It's not, these are not large programs. So that will be all taken care of on site. Um, Pathways Academy is a, another opportunity for us, a school that we have um, had on the Belmont campus quite successfully for a long time. This will finally give them their ability to have their own building and to be able to expand uh, potentially some of their services and certainly to be able to rearrange them in a building that will be much more hospitable for educational services. So Laura Mead is here with me tonight. She's the educational administrator for Pathways and she'll describe that program. Thank you. Um, so Pathways Academy is, we're a small school, a maximum of 32 students. We average about 27. Um, we serve students age six through 22. I would say typically the youngest is about third grade in reality, and we do grow right up to 22. Um, and we are a kind of a small community. So each classroom has four students, one special ed teacher certified, and one what we call a school counselor. It's like a teacher's assistant. And um, the students do the regular kind of academics, the typical core academics, the typical electives that you'd see in any school. Um, the one thing that we 
add differently in terms of classes is a social pragmatics class, which the students have as like a direct core subject. And then we also infuse it in everything we do. So the nature of the students that attend Pathways are students usually with disorders on the autism spectrum that need a lot of social skills support. And so we teach it directly, and then all staff are supporting it at all times throughout the day. Um, the other kind of piece we bring in is sensory integration, where we have in between every 45-minute class a 15-minute sensory integration break. Um, the goals for sensory integration are developed by our OTs, and all staff support the students in working. And it's kind of a time for kids. It's just break time, play time. But for um, those of us working behind the scenes and the students that are getting to know their own needs and what they're working on. It's what they need to do to get ready for the next class to kind of sustain, sustain them throughout the day. Um, so we have, uh, in general, the population is for the most part college bound, but it's not gonna be a typical, you know, leave high school at 18 and head off to a four year. We have a lot of dual enrollment when we have older students who might be um, at Pathways for an extra year after 12th grade, they might take a community college class, a couple days a week, Pathways another, and that's a great way for us to help them transition into the world of higher ed. Great. Uh, are there any other, any questions from the committee? Just, sure. a, yes, just a clarification, so, um, so about 30 in each program, does that sound right? So is that, is it, it sounds like you said 32 is your limit, and 30 is yours? Approximately, right. yes, for the two re residential programs. Okay, yeah. and is the space then equally divided or is there there's greater need in one, one of the programs than the other? Uh, so the, the way that we are envisioning um, it would be that Pathways will have their own building. That mm -hmm. will be the only programming that will be in, in their dedicated building. And, um, <clears throat> and that was selected because of the larger areas that could be made into classrooms because a lot of the space is already more um, sort of dormitory focused in a way. Mm -hmm. So we'll use the, we'll have a, a boys program and a girls program and they'll be in two, two separate buildings and then there'll be another building that where some of the other programming where people will come together and office space will be. So it'll be pretty spread out, okay. but within the confines of the Jermaine Lawrence campus there. Yes, Mr. Hainer. Did I understand you right? We have two programs, a day program and a residential program? Or did I misunderstand? The school, the school is a day program. Is a day program? Yep. And have you started the residential part of it? Not yet, no. So that's coming, okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I just want to clarify, Pathways isn't going residential. I understand that. Okay. Just I understand. I went to uh, w one of the community meetings and I, I, I was wondering, you clarified it, thank you. Yes, I think when we had the community meeting, we weren't sure exactly which of the residential programs, how Correct. this was all gonna work out. At this right. point, I think we've got a pretty clear sense of what will work well in those, in those buildings and be able to have the appropriate uh, mixing and separation for folks. If, if I right. just sure. clarify, yep. Tonight, are we approving both programs or just this, the Pathways program tonight and then coming back for the residential program later? I don't know. I'm asking. I believe the request is for Pathways. For the school. Right. Yeah, for yes. the school. For the approval of the to school. To the extent there's educational mm -hmm. component of the residential program that's not provided by Pathways, then you'll have to figure out whether you need to come back to us for that or not. But that's... Right, that would be separate. Okay, in general, that's handled through the program and we've been handling within the hospital services because the length of stay is so short. Right. It's like a hospitalization. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. Use, tutor, you use a vendor for tutoring. So when we have students placed in a right. hospital setting, that, there's, most of the hospitals have vendors yes. in which that's, we pay directly. That's not our purview. Yeah, thank so you. That would be. Okay, right. great. Right. Thank you. Clarifies it. Dr. Ethan Ampey, you're next. Yeah, so um, as Mr. Cardin said, we haven't done this in decades. Um, so my questions aren't implying anything about your program. It's just um, I think we're tasked with evaluating and approving it. So that's what I'm trying to do. Um, one question in your program description, um, it says most students at Pathways Academy have had negative experiences in programs with strict ABA philosophies and benefit from our system of social pragmatic learning and natural consequences. And I was wondering if you could discuss that a little bit more because I don't understand, you know, nowhere else do you explain what the natural consequences are, how, 
what's happening with the students? Sure. Um, we find that, and as I think all educators find, ABA is a wonderful tool for so many students, especially students on the spectrum. But there seems to be kind of a subset of kids that are dealing with so much anxiety that aren't able to do better just in order to earn something, that they're actually already doing the best they can, and that when they're in a structure where if they don't earn a certain amount of points, they then don't get a certain kind of reward or something similar like that, and I realize it's a kind of a strict ABA interpretation, um, we find that they will say, well, why try it all and just shut down? Or maybe it's not a thinking process, it's just a shutting down. So we use a natural um, consequences, pragmatics approach where everything is a learning opportunity. So literally, if a student comes into class, swipes everything off the table, we look at that as staff um, and we think, what do we need to do differently? It's not about the student adhering to our expectations in the moment. It is what's their behavior telling us and what can we do to help them be in a place where they feel a little safer. Um, and then when they're calm, we can say, and it might be let's go for a break or do you need a snack? <coughs> let's go shoot some baskets, all sorts of different strategies that we can do because of our small ratio and our small school um, size. When they're calmer, we can say, you know, I could tell you were pretty upset when you, you know, swiped everything off the desk. What's another way you can let me know that you were really tired and you weren't ready? You know, if we find out that they were tired, what's another way you can let us know? Our goal is to have kids use words and be able to ask for a break whenever they need it. And a lot of people will say, well, if kids can ask for breaks, aren't they just taking breaks all day? Like the whole day is a break. But we actually don't find that. Um, a lot of times transitioning from programs that weren't successful where they didn't experience success, it takes a little while to trust that if they ask for a break, they really can get it. So there is still some acting out, but we see the acting out go way down because we're really able to just pull back our demands when the students are struggling. So we call it a social pragmatics approach because it's, it's always kind of relationship building, conversational, what's another way you can let me know using words, which are more socially expected when you're having a hard time. Okay. I think what I was coming, it sounds like what you mean by natural consequences is not what I've heard of in parenting as natural consequences where, you know, if your student, I mean, if your child says, well, I'm not going to study, then the natural consequences are you fail the test or something. And, and that's, I was concerned about that. Um, then the other question, I had two other questions. One is in terms of the social learning, it sound the, the, curriculum that you gave sounded excellent. I just wondered, it seemed like each week or month there was a new topic and they were never came back again. You know, it's like bing, 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 bing. And, and it just seems like, especially from the students that you're describing, that wouldn't they benefit from coming back and revisiting the same topic? Right. Um, for the most part, the social pragmatic goals and objectives in the students' IEPs are the main ones they need to work on. So those we're always coming back to. It might not be part of the class, literally the class lesson, but kind of what they're working on, what staff are working on with the students all the time. Um, we do hit the same themes every single year. So we have a lot of kids that say, I don't need to learn about conversation. We already did this. But they actually do. And so we have to change it up and make it interesting. But it is over time they do keep kind of coming back. Um, and can I say real quick about the natural consequences? I actually forgot to mention that it's a, it plays a big role in terms of the social skills. Um, if we have a student that acts out, um, and we might have to ask other students to leave the room if we can't move the student, because we go to great lengths to not put hands on, as all of you do um, as well here. And we're really trying to say, like, well, you know, John might not want to spend break with you because you told him, I hate you. <laughs> and so helping them see the natural social consequences. Or we're going to spend time, you're going to work with a teacher away from the group because the group didn't feel safe when you threw your chair. Mm -hmm. So that kind of thing. Um, and then my final question is just, if it, as a day school, how are your students getting to and from the school? Uh, they're transported by the district. So we have a lot of little minivans with the school bus tag on it. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm, j I'm just trying to understand the structure. Uh, so essentially what you're doing is running two programs, one of which is residential and one of is a day program, serving similar population. So what do you say? Um, the populations are similar. I would say that some of the techniques that get used actually probably are similar. 
but with different uh, kids, slightly different age group, and different expectations of what the goals are going to be for how, how they're going to um, be helped. Well, granted, the, the kids in yeah. a residential program have a higher level of need, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> you're you're working within sort of a similar domain. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. 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 I, I think the other thing is is because our, our behavioral health approach to, to things, mm -hmm. you know, I think a lot of these things we're describing them as fairly siloed in what they are, mm -hmm. and people have a, a variety of interventions that are possible and we're fortunate that we have professionals and one of the things we often see is that the programs work together mm -hmm. and that if we have a depth of uh, ability to work with people with obsessive compulsive disorder mm -hmm. or con that kind of um, very specific uh, need that has a very specific intervention with it can often be very usefully deployed in, in, a, in a place where they're, they're, they can work with the faculty as well as the other clinicians that are there. Now. Um, the residential students are going to be members of our community. Uh, what is the advice you would have for us as members of the community as well uh, when we meet our, our neighbors? So, in, uh, good question. I think that these people who are in uh, a residential setting like this, mm -hmm. these uh, individuals choose to be there. Mm -hmm. There is no one there because they've been placed there or committed there or anything like that. They are there because they want to engage in a pretty rigorous form of, of treatment and educational and skill building and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. So they are very much just like any other individual who's made a commitment to try to improve their, their skill sets, mm -hmm. their behaviors. And uh, these are individuals, adolescents, young adults, who have found that uh, basically they've got pretty much normal intellectual mm -hmm. functioning, all of that. Mm -hmm. It's just that their socio-emotional development or their impulsivity or their inability to sort of keep keep their lives in an organized progression has been come to a point where they really want to dig in and do something mm -hmm. about it and that's what these programs are all about they're very immersive they are well very well staffed with professionals and educators and people mm -hmm. to really work with them and those high staffing ratios and and we have them through day and evening and, and night coverage as well everything is fully staffed for us with awake staff to be able to really use the time wisely and to benefit for them I really see being a welcoming community be an important part of the supports that will enable uh, your students to progress, which is why I'm really interested in our role as, in Arlington to be partners with you mm -hmm. in your work, uh, because these are our kids too. Even if they don't originate in Arlington, they're, they're now our neighbors and people we have to care about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. Hainer. I just want to add, the, the, these folks had a, uh, a open forum uh, meeting at the Park Ave mm -hmm. Community Church for the neighbors, uh, the prospective neighbors at the time, and I, I'm happy to say that the vast majority of the people were very, there were a lot of concerns brought forward that night, and I thought they did an excellent job in responding to them, and the feeling that I got was the community was very responsive in a positive way mm -hmm. in having this uh, program brought there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gordy? Um, uh, adding to that, uh, uh, we met uh, about a week ago, and you met with myself, Dr. McNeil, Ms. Elmer, and our Director of Science, uh, uh, Sam Hoyo, who's here tonight as well. And we, we talked for about an hour, and we were very impressed with their programming. Um, and in fact, there was a lot of questioning about the specific science lessons that we're going to um, be offered to students, and one of the, one of the things that we have all agreed is that to the extent that we can share professional development or share resources, mm -hmm. we are certainly going to um, to try to have that kind of partnership as we go forward. So, from the four of us who met with them, we would recommend uh, the approval of this program. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. So. I don't have the state law open, but <laughs> under the state law and under our policy, you know, we, we are delegated the responsibility to review the program and make sure the curriculum is adequate. I forget mm -hmm. the exact language. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think 
this ever comes up again, we may want to have a subcommittee. Mm. I think this, we had the timing issue here, but we may want to have a subcommittee be more clearly delegate to the superintendent mm -hmm. to do what she actually did in this case. So fortunately, mm -hmm. she did do it <laughs> uh, and and did because uh, we're not really qualified to review right. the curriculum. Right. Right. So um, can I get a motion to approve so move. the program? Second. All those any any discussion? Just one quick question. Sure. When you use the word district, are you referring to your district or to the Arlington School District? For the busing. For the For busing. busing yeah. The sending school districts. The sending school. Thank you. You're just covering the, the money part. <laughs> all right. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. yes. Any opposed or abstentions? Great. It's unanimous. Thank you Thank very you. much for coming. Before Thank you very us. much. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome to Arlington. <laughs> yes. All right. So next up is the elementary budget presentation. Welcome to the all, principals. Yeah, we have all seven principals here, as well as some of our directors. Um, they'll come up and they'll introduce themselves. We have as director Sarah Bird, who mm -hmm. we were here at the last, Susan Bisson for literacy, uh, for um, digital literacy, and Sam Hoyo for science. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Michael Hanna, I'm principal of Stratton Elementary, and um, all seven elementary principals are here tonight, um, but uh, I was elected to uh, give a, a brief summary of um, the uh, budget priorities document that you've been presented with. Um, a very brief process, and uh, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Dr. Bodie and Dr. McNeil for giving us such uh, ample time and space to talk as a collegial group uh, about budget priorities, um, both talking to us from a district perspective and then really listening and cultivating our conversation from a school level as well. So thank you to both of them uh, and their leadership. Uh, and thanks to the school committee for the opportunity to have this conversation about our schools. We are grateful, deeply grateful for the continued support of our work as well as the opportunity to provide leadership in a district that values a, a very high quality educational experience for children. From all that we've experienced in Arlington, and that comes from a, um, a many years of, of being principals here in Arlington, this fact has been unwavering. We'd like to open this year with a short expression of appreciation for the financial support of our initiatives from last year, both to the school committee and to the town of Arlington. Um, we have a story to tell, and it begins in FY20, in the first year of this multi-year plan, when school funding was provided for many things, and we'd like to highlight these uh, three particular areas that we found especially important to our work already this year. This is uh, increased staffing for specialist faculty, uh, so faculty in art, music, physical education, and library. Um, additional staffing for assistant principals in the schools, and then additional instructional coaches uh, to support curriculum and instruction. So first, the increase in specialist staffing has had two significant impacts for student achievement. First, students have accessed and become more proficient in the four traditional specialist programming areas of physical education, music, visual art, and, and library media. Uh, second, grade level teams, including special educators, now have weekly progress monitoring and instructional design time for all the students in a given grade. The addition, secondly, the, the, set, the addition of assistant principals to the school-based administrative team has had a deep impact on the programming for students both directly since individual students and environments can now be much more supported with an additional administrator, but also indirectly because now the principal has the opportunity to give the school consistent instructional leadership uh, and not simply act as a sort of reactive backstop to the twists and turns of typical busy days in schools. So the professional culture in schools has improved significantly because of this investment. And then finally, instructional coaches are responsible in our view for the most direct, immediate, and effective impact on instructional improvement. 
uh, the opportunity to have collegial feedback and challenge and practice from a trusted colleague is aligned with what we know to be the most effective approaches to instructional improvement that we know of. So this year, the elementary principal team continues to approach budget requests with a multiple year view. So rather look at FY21 in isolation, we once again considered the district priorities, requests from our faculty, our leadership emphases, funding commitments from last year that were able to be um, provided, and the resources that we have and need, to, and need to support students and teachers in demonstrating success and high achievement. So the staffing model that you have in, um, in the table in front of you we're presenting considers the day-to-day -day experience of our students and teachers and also the district priorities that we are supporting as an administrative team. But of highest priority on the list are equity among all schools as it relates to literacy instructional support and then the addition of uh, uh, the hiring of additional assistant principals. We believe the overall needs of our schools are also continuing to grow as enrollment increases. So what will be important to continue to consider are the need for increased administrative support due to continued student growth and daily building demands, including building safety and maintaining the efficacy of our supervision and evaluation system. So with increased uh, student enrollment, of course, comes increased staffing, which comes increased supervisory responsibilities. Also, aligned high quality instruction that supports significant and ongoing curriculum reform and improvement. And finally, continued focus on safe and supportive schools, which includes a continued development of social emotional learning programming and an improvement of practice centered on cultural proficiency. So we believe that the items listed are the most immediate need in terms of staffing requests to do uh, all of these district priorities and meet district goals. Uh, we continue to support the multi-year plan in the ways it addresses other areas such as materials and obviously professional development and learning. Some additional programming requests that would strengthen curriculum and instruction which were also, of which we're also supportive is an additional ELL faculty, uh, an additional library media specialist, digital learning specialist, social studies instructional coach along with an, a science instructional coach another and another literacy math instructional coach as we mentioned before this seems um, from the research to have some of the most profound impact on instructional improvement mm -hmm. finally also a physical therapy assessment assistant and a half-time team chair at the elementary level one last request is to highlight the continued need for a review of staffing at the classroom level and within our special education department. These line items are in the multi-year plan and we ask for your continued support in maintaining low and equitable numbers across our schools. Again, thank you very much for this time. Uh, we'd love to take some time uh, to, in the conversation to answer questions and also speak about the experiences in our schools that may underscore the importance of each of these staffing requests. Great, thank you very much. Is anyone who would like to start with questions? I can, I can start for a change if you would. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll start. So uh, one thing to note is that your enrollment this year is only up by 30 students over last year, yet we added three sections. Or four. Do we add four or three? Three or four classrooms for only 30, net 30 increase because of the way things fell. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want, you know, I would expect that to continue to the increase to be in the 30 to 40 range and then to start to trail off as your classes of 500 move up because um, the class of 590 looks like it's going to be an aberration and will probably settle in the 530 to 540s so as you're looking at staffing next year I do think you need to take a more serious look at making sure there's some equity across schools. So we're, in some places we have 70 students, we have four sections, at another school we only have three sections. Um, we probably need to flip those to three sections, even though the four sections is a nice to have, simply because the enrollment growth is not gonna justify adding enough teachers to keep that small level if we wanna do some of this other stuff. So 
just something to think about as you're actually planning each individual building. Um, my other question was about the assistant principals. What specifically, where would these 2.0 FTE be added? What's, what's left? I think so. Thompson is actually in the budget this year, but you didn't hire. So is that included again? Mm -hmm. Or what's, what is the 2.0? Well, I guess I didn't hire this year yet for an assistant principal. Um, the part time didn't draw a lot of uh, candidates. And my colleagues, I think, you know, got some great candidates from that small pool. Um, so, Yes, I also think that at some point, given that I'm a school of over 500 at this point, there's no half-time evaluations, there's no half-time issues. Uh, and I also know that my colleagues are feeling that, and you guys can speak for this yourselves, having an additional time um, with their assistant principal, maybe making it more consistent, upping a bit here at, at one school or another, so that you can get three days instead of two or two and a half. Um, so the positions are not necessarily just geared towards one particular place uh, or only one person at one place. I don't know if... <laughs> we really do believe that the school should all be building towards a full-time assistant principal. Mm -hmm. We know that that's not something that can happen all at once, that it is something that we need to do through the multi-year plan. Um, so in that two ask for those two FTEs, we would uh, be requesting full-time at Thompson and then building two full-time at Dallin and at Bishop. Um, Stratton has a full-time assistant principal. Hardy has a half-time assistant principal and a half-time team chair. Um, and while sometimes that does present other kinds of challenges, it is a full-time, very capable person who works very hard. Um, so that's something that we could look at down the road and then also, you know, in other schools as well. Okay, thanks. So in the five-year plan, we had only budgeted, only planned for half a principal at each school. So going to full-time, and I understand things change. We're not wedded to the five-year plan, but that would, that would take something away that we were actually, I mean, we don't, have, we don't even have enough money to cover everything that was in the plan. Right, so I think as you're prioritizing, mm -hmm. what is it that you want to take away? I mean, it sounds like you're deferring digital learning specialists. So is, are, you, are you saying these assistant principals are more important than adding a digital learning specialist to each building? Well, I think what we're saying is that, do you want to answer? Go no. ahead. I, I think that's a fair question, right? In, to, to um, I think we would need to really spend some time to prioritize. I mean, there's quite mm -hmm. a few yeah. um, requests that are, are laid out over that five years to really prioritize what that would be. Um, I think would be a collaborative conversation between us, um, some of our curriculum directors, Rod and Kathy. And is there, why were you thinking, the, no, the, so, why I mean, that position come to mind So first? Yeah, because it's not in the, it's not in the, the priority list now, right? So it's the digital learning specialist and it is down in the, here are some additional things. So with coaches. Right, and, with the coaches. Mm -hmm. yeah. So so you see, you see, you know, I, I do think it's a fair question of the, the additional um, staffing requests or positions that we recognize mm -hmm. are important for our schools. Where would we prioritize assistant principals mm -hmm. on top of some of those? Yeah. I think that would be a conversation we'd want to have with co mm -hmm. uh, directors and Rod and Kathy. Sure, go ahead. What you're hearing tonight in the previous meeting was what are the, the things that um, emerge uh, that from the, the second year of the plan? I, I want to remind you that the second year of the plan had over $2 million worth of ass. So there's always a prioritization and some things move forward. And... Uh, as we have in past years, we will look at all of these things and have to prioritize. And they're, they're tough decisions. They really are because they're all things that we think that are important and we will go through this process together when we bring the budget to you. Um, I personally think we should have more than 2.0 um, in, the, in the FTEs for assistant principal. I think that 
the impact has been very positive. And um, as we increase the number of demands, I'm just that go, that there's just things just always creep up in terms of more demands and more demands. I think that it's a, a it's something that's important for schools. So um, this will be the work of January, and it's helpful to hear your feedback and some the, your comments. I think are very helpful in terms of thinking about this. Um, but we will have to do that because our number, the amount of money that we will have incrementally. Uh, to uh, you know, to put into positions, will uh, be limited. Yeah, I was I was focusing on it because it is a change from mm -hmm. what's in the five-year plan. So it's it is significant. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. All right. Other questions? Yeah. Go ahead, Ms. Morgan. Yes. So um, I was I, you know, as as I said to the middle mm -hmm. school and high school principals when they were here only a week ago. It seems like a lot longer. Um, I didn't expect that we were going to sort of take the five-year plan and say, here's the FY21 column. Okay, good. Check, check. Great. Have a good night, you know, and be gone in five minutes. So, um, but I think what's interesting for us is to reconcile between the two and the piece that um, is there's a pretty significant investment in, in FY21 um, in the SLC programs and in expanding inclusion programming. So um, there were pretty big asks for that. And this might be a question for Ms. Elmer as well, which is fine. I don't see that fully reflected in this ask. I see the 1.0 special education learning specialist, um, but I don't see, you know, it looks like there was a pretty, like there was, you know, about 180,000 in the five-year plan that looks like um, for inclusion and then um, increased staffing in the SLC classrooms at the elementary level. And I'm kind of curious where that went. And, and, I, and to Dr. Bodhi's point, I understand that like we're not, you know, we're we're working through that. But I I I'd, I'd mm -hmm. like to know why we're not, why we we don't. That was only three. That's three positions, so they're asking for one of them. Three, three to one is kind of a big change. It's a lot fewer people. When we look at the amount of money that we have available and all the priority issues for everybody, we probably make some tough decisions. Okay, Ms. Seuss. Uh, so in the narrative, uh, what you emphasized was uh, assistant principal and literacy. So I want to know, so literacy I assume is the 2.0 or 2.1 reading staff, right? So, so were the 2.1 uh, available, what would that look like at each school? What kind of reading staff would you have? Actually, we're all looking at each other because there is a, a breakout of that. Um, we had thought that that was in the, the link was in your document, but if not, um, we can provide that as far as like breakout. Oh, or, at each school. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting some of it from the, um, from the teacher's document, but I, yeah, it's, I'm sort of having to read between lines, and yeah, I don't see that, so okay. that'd be helpful. Yeah, yeah. We'll provide that. Okay. And I think the piece of looking at the structure of the reading program is something that we all like to do across the board for a lot of the different areas in which we work, which is trying to you know come to a place where we're looking at it like that that support being more equitably distributed, and that we have a process and a way of doing that, so that we are seeing that over years we can build on that process and make sure that um, we're giving the same, well, not exactly the same, but, you know, supporting resources between our different schools that are equitable. And if I could say more generally, you know, there's a, there's a, um, a real sort of shift in, in our thinking about the role of the learning, the reading specialist and the general education teacher um, through uh, the leadership of the superintendent and assistant superintendent this year we have really had a, a supported emphasis on uh, the practice of the general educator supporting that and, and how they can do what they need to do to engage more brain-based reading instruction that's really getting traction. And so our reading specialist asks, won't, won't be simply to have more people to pull children out of classrooms mm -hmm. to do reading instruction, but also to be, in a way, instructional coaches right. um, to our general educators and how to do things in a tier one framework. 
Um, so we're, we're really excited by the prospect and just the momentum we've already gotten in this way, uh, under this uh, movement. Yeah. And, and then just one more. I know Matt Coleman's not here, but I know in the past he's often advocated for equity between literacy and reading and mathematics as, as being sort of complementary skills. Um, and I know it's also a particularly weak point in several of our MCAS for our low, um, low income and some other, other categories. Um, and so if we boost the reading, do we sort of leave math behind? Or are we in a good place with math? One of the things that's been really positive is remember now we're um, staffed with a full-time coach, mathematics mm -hmm. coach in all of our buildings. So mm -hmm. that's still relatively new. Mm -hmm. um, we've Not just, full time, but that each of the buildings has. Each yeah. of the building has a dedicated, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. math yes. coach. Um, and we're, we've just um, finished up three years of pretty intensive uh, curriculum rollout with professional development. So mm -hmm. I think the emphasis for the past few years has really heavily been on mathematics. And I, the, having um, a dedicated staff member to continue that work of professional learning um, in the math coach really has set us up to be in a, um, a pretty good place. Particularly, you know, when we'll continue to follow our, our achievement scores to see if that's reflected there as well. Um, I think early literacy and the work that we're doing with early literacy, particularly around um, how we're using assessments and how we're um, watching students' early reading skills uh, unfold over the first few years of learning. We're recognizing that the need for you know, reading specialists right now and having a, uh, some equity in their caseloads too, I and mean, with the amount of students that we have uh, is important, important for us to address. And there, I think the reason why it's hard for us to just spit out exactly what the 2.1 looks like, yeah. I think for some of us it looks like a 0.3. There's, right. We're trying to ensure that we have flexibility um, in our buildings to, so that students aren't missing reading instruction in their classrooms mm -hmm. um, and so that those few people can do work across six grades mm -hmm. you know, for the students in our school. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a big part of what we're thinking about with the reading teacher that connects back to what we were talking about with our specialists and that big ask last year. So we've, we, if we can get more people dedicated within our individual buildings and not having to travel, not having to have schedules that, you know, so that will help them to be more part of that programming that we're developing. So we just had this incredible experience that we uh, have these dedicated people in our buildings. We've totally turned the schedule into something completely different that is having this incredibly positive impact. And now we have all this dedicated common planning time and data team meeting time and, and all of these people who are really focusing in. And the goals within those meetings are often, to go back to your question, mathematical and basis, right? And so, as well as the literacy piece. But when we do have... Um, you know, to make these decisions, and I think we're very, very much aware of how we have to make decisions. It's all very important, right? But that we really are focusing in on that reading piece as being the place that we need to put those time, the resources, the money. So I just have a follow-up all around the math intervention piece. So uh, talking with a parent, um, there apparently, and something that Mr. Coleman has said, unfortunately he's not here, but. There is apparently an, a math intervention model at the Title I schools that's not available at the other schools. Can you talk about that and also in the context of equity? You know, I, I talked to a parent who was not at a Title I school and was unable to access that program. Mm. Can you describe what that program is? And, and Yeah. Yeah, I can speak to that. So uh, Stratton School is a Title I school that, that benefits from a full-time math um, instructional interventionist. Um, they are... Uh, part of all of those general education um, weekly progress monitoring meetings when the focus is mathematics, obviously. Um, and at those meetings, we're now able to design very targeted um, together uh, uh, instructional supports that, that Mr. Deck then is dispatched to do. So it's very planful. It's very focused on very specific students with very specific achievement goals. Um, and so that that is a, a rich opportunity is definitely the case. Uh, we, you know, this is, you know, some inequity loaded into the nature of Title I and having targeted schools that, that 
aren't all seven elementary schools, and that's the case in Arlington as it is in every district in, in the country. And so um, to, to try to, you know, match that through other funding sources um, is certainly, yeah, laudable, and, and uh, I have to confess that I haven't acquainted myself with, with how that is imitated or looks and sounds in, in other schools. Um, but I think that when we're, when we're weighing it, it's not just because it's a district priority to be focusing on literacy um, instructional improvement, but because of the, the discrete and um, really highly trained instructional intervention frameworks that are part of reading instruction, whether you wanna be certified in Orton-Gillingham or in Wilson, um, because, I mean, these are, they require just a, um, a level of instructional support that's tied to brain-based assessments that as yet, you know, we don't have that kind of discrete instructional support in math instruction and maybe as, as our kids get smarter, they'll be able to, to do just that. But um, that's why I think we have this, this emphasis on um, uh, getting a, a group of people who are trained in those discrete reading areas to be in the, in the buildings. Okay, and the one instructionist that is in the list would be split at other schools. Math, sorry, math and interventionist yeah, that is in the list would be split between of the other the non-title one schools, or what? Do you know what that yeah, role would yeah. be? Fe feasting on that title one grant, I'm not sure how we. How we support it at one point, I was split up. Do you remember? It, it hasn't been determined yet. Okay, but it would be generally just trying this model. to trying to get again. It's in, in, incremental staffing each year. In the five-year plan, if you um, remember, and they were sort of talking about literacy and mathematics, the goal was to have a literacy coach and, of course, more than one sometimes reading teacher in a building, but then also a math coach and a math interventionist. And so as we're doing with lots of things, we, we're trying to build that, but you can't do it all at once. And that's, we recognize that too. One of the things we also have in the schools, which um, are math practice guides. This was a program started, I don't know, what was it, 10 years ago? Quite a while ago, nine. nine. In which we have people who are, are trained to come in and, and support the early grades in, it's a, it's a form of math intervention. Um, they're paid on a, a different rate, a tutoring rate. So. There, there are ways that we've been doing it to try to accomplish it in a little bit less expensive way, but these, I have to say, the people we have doing it are excellent. And in fact, some of them have actually uh, gone into other positions. So, like many of these things, I think in, it'll, it'll still be, we're still figuring out exactly where it will go. Mm -hmm. Ms. Morgan? Just to follow up about the reading intervention, we heard last week and have been um, being updated a lot about what we're doing in the early grades in kindergarten and first grade with different kinds of assessments, which is really exciting. It's a big part of the superintendent's instructional goals for this year, which is, is great. And um, so I guess my what I'm curious is, is um, do you do you see the need for more reading support and reading specialists as a result of these changes or or not yet or you know because what I guess my what I'm wondering is is you know we're sort of in this like nascent stage with some really you know exciting interesting um, evaluation of our very earliest readers um, and so I'm I'm wondering you know are we going to come back next year and say oh my gosh we actually need like you know we we are identifying so many more kids that we need so much more reading support or so I, I guess how is that ask going sort of hand in hand with what we're doing in the earliest grades if anybody could speak to that yeah and I, <coughs> I think that's what we're all, we're all thinking about too um, it the investment right now in reading specialists is important because of that very point everybody's learning um, something new about early literacy instruction and our reading specialists have had this you know, experience for, you know, some of them for 10 plus almost since approaches for how do we grow phonemic awareness, phonics, um, and other skills with our students. 
If we got to a point where all of a sudden we saw even more and more students, I think what we'd want to put our money on is professional development and professional learning for our staff. Because really what we want is our students to be receiving what they need in their classrooms as much as possible. Okay. So um, I think we should keep that conversation iterative. Let's come back to it. But right now, I think that what's important is that we have um, adequate intervention staff to meet the needs of our earliest readers and provide support for our classroom teachers who are really interested in learning more about reading instruction um, and trying to provide students what they need. That's a good point, though. It is, and it's something we've talked about a lot. It's that what do we need right this minute, and then what do we need to help support us in that vision going forward? Because it is, it's true, what we're talking about is that the classroom teachers are the ones who need to be able to do this work primarily. But it's an interesting thing the way classroom teachers are trained and the way reading specialists are trained. You know, I was trained as a reading specialist, but that was such a long time ago that we didn't talk about any of this stuff. And now the way people are coming into this as reading specialists, they have this kind of experience in the work that they're doing. But a general educator does not have that. That's not part of our teacher preparation programs. And the teachers are eating it up. They love it. But it's going to take some time to get to that point where people are feeling really comfortable and confident with the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Because we want everyone to be present in that environment of their classroom getting what they need. So it's a long and a short term kind of thing. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate you all being here. So just to emphasize that we should get that document, if the extra document that they said mm -hmm. was attached that we didn't get. They said there was another, <laughs> there was a, a link to a digital yeah. document just to make sure that we get that. Yeah. Uh, and now we have the AEA presenting on uh, their view of elementary needs. Uh, Ms. Nolan is going to present, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming tonight. On behalf of the AEA, I really appreciate you having me. Um, so I just want to preface before I share that we know that there's a lot of, there's a, a huge monetary impact in terms of what we're asking for. Um, but when we go to our membership and we ask what the priorities are, right now there's two kind of big overwhelming overarching themes. Um, it has to do a lot with um, support staff and um, looking at the number of students in small group as well as whole group settings. Um, so when we look at Monotomy Preschool, um, we just, there's a return of a seventh preschool class. And at this point in time, with that increase in class size, um, comes the need for an additional behaviorist and an additional speech language pathologist. Um, at the Bishop and at Dallin, we are asking for additional teachers of English language learners, um, looking at our goal of cultural competency um, as well as just um, looking at different ways of instructing students with these types of needs. So looking at potential opportunities to push into classrooms as well as to pull out. Um, looking at parity across the district, looking at a full-time learning specialist to be added to the Pierce School. Um, right now that is the only building at the elementary level that has only two learning specialists. We're looking for three. Um, there's a real need across the district right now for additional support when it comes to occupational therapy. The caseload demands have increased district-wide. Um, in order to meet those demands, we will need an additional 1.0 FDE occupational therapist at least. Um, class sizes are a real concern with teachers right now. Um, there are a lot of demands in the classroom in terms of student learning needs. And so um, with increases in student class sizes, teachers are finding themselves more and more extended. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so teachers are really advocating for teaching assistants to support um, in the classroom in grades one and two with 22 or more students and in grades three to five with 24 or more students. Um, and just looking at the general needs of students across um, the curriculum when it comes to just having more chairs and more students in the room. Um, additional team chairs at the elementary level. Um, compliance is a real issue. Um, we know that our last CPR, there were some issues with compliance and looking at ensuring that each building has a full-time person who can um, make sure that compliance happens with the paperwork and with the meetings. 
um, looking at increasing BCBA support in the district. We have a lot of students with social, emotional, and behavioral needs. Um, and right now we have three BCBAs district-wide that are doing the work of <laughs> many. Um, and so looking at increasing that support so that students can have behavioral plans um, that respond to the challenges that they have in the classroom setting. Um, our teachers are reporting that they are having challenges with the great body shop curriculum in terms of the, the uh, materials that they have available to them, that they're not updated at this point in time, and that updated materials are necessary for them. Um, we're asking for an increase in terms of the social work, um, in terms of social workers. We're finding that students are having more and more social emotional needs that they're bringing to the classroom, um, and that responding to those needs warrants more staff who are able to not only respond to crises, but also to provide direct intervention as part of a scheduled service. Um, we're looking for an increase in the amount of learning specialists district-wide. Um, we are trying to be a lot more um, creative in the way that we provide services to students, both in small group settings as well as um, in whole group contexts. And so the idea being that if we can increase learning specialists, we can have a lot more creativity and um, collaboration happening between teachers um, when it comes to responding to student needs. Um, similar to the request when it came to the elementary principals, um, we're looking for an increase in reading specialists. So um, yes, the goal is always to have students get what they need in the general education classroom setting, um, but there's also a recognition that with, um, with Baker's um, passage of you know, dyslexia screenings is going to be a real thing for students in younger grades, that um, our RTI, our response to intervention resources right now are not adequate to respond to those needs. Um, and there also is a recognition that right now reading teachers are also servicing students on IEPs at times. And so um, if we want to be able to really capture and catch those kids who are at risk early on and do those interventions, we're going to need more people to help support that. Um, and then the last piece has to do with projectors. Um, it may sound silly, but there are teachers who are actually having to move projectors in and out of rooms. Um, it's not super uh, feasible to always have to leave your room to go get a projector. The other piece is that there are safety concerns when it comes to cords hanging around the, the rooms. So teachers have asked that if it would be possible to actually have them mounted in the rooms so they can actually project what they need onto a wall without having to leave the room or to have cords kind of dangling around everywhere. Um, so that's our ask for this evening. Um, I know I went through that really quickly, but I don't know if there's questions or concerns. Great. Thank you. Questions? No questions? Um, I'll, well, you go first. Can I? Um, have we seen the technology plan yet? Did I miss that? No? Yes. I'm just wondering about the projectors mm -hmm. and if they're in the tech plan or not. Mm -hmm. Or Sorry. Uh, we have done some upgrades of projectors throughout the district, uh, actually not this past summer, but the summer before last. Uh, we went through each one of the schools at the elementary level and replaced all uh, projectors with new ones that had the HDMI cable. And um, so, I mean, there's always going to be work to do with that. And so we have presented our, we did present our technology plan last year okay. for the three years. So I could, I can make that available for you. No, no, I can go back and, yeah. if you, you, we did it here, right? Yes, yeah, okay. we did. Yep. Right. yep. I will, I can research mm -hmm. that. Sure, but we're always like, mm -hmm. you know, we, we meet regularly with the union. Um, they have a, in a technology meeting. Um, so we do, we are aware of the various needs that Marion is talking about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think there's just a concern too that some of the newer technology that we're getting isn't necessarily um, able to connect with and be fitted with old infrastructure. And so looking at, for example, when we went to Google Chromebooks, um, you know, if you have um, Apple infrastructure, it, they don't work together, right? So um, looking at how can we take what already exists and make sure that any new ads also allow us to, to teach in a way that's mm -hmm. effective. Um, you know, and Julie just kind of um, whispered a, a point to me also is that not only are we asking for classroom settings, but also for the small group context. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those, you know, smaller interventionist classrooms are the ones that are forgotten a lot of times when it comes to um, various needs, whether it even just comes to space needs in general. Um, we think about class sizes, oftentimes we don't necessarily think about 
you know, when these kids leave a room to go to a small group setting, are there actually spaces for them to do that in effectively? And then also looking at, um, you know, access to projectors and technology in those spaces as well. Go ahead. Oh, I just have a question. The great body shop, I thought, was entirely taken off the teacher's plates. Is that not true? Or classroom teachers to classroom. gym teachers. We would move from classroom. Yeah, no, it just says it, uh, the upper materials. grades. What? It's the materials. And in fact, we've no, ordered them. No, but is, them. It, is it, this one seems to indicate that uh, classroom teachers in grade four and five continue to teach it. I, I thought it was completely changed. No. It's, it's, is that not true? It's mm. been doing PE teachers. Uh, the nurse is doing some of that. The nurse are doing some of that. Uh, right. Are right. classroom so. teachers doing it in fourth and fifth grade? So that's, that's during the team time. Mm -hmm. So the team time um, at K through three, they have the extra uh, specials. But in grades four and five, that, that's where we discussed they're going to have the chorus and they have the digital literacy. So the teachers are still teaching mm -hmm. part of the... Teachers are still you, teaching part of the fifth grade. The units have been, grade, the right, units have the been taken time. off. Um, we recognize that we need the materials, and in fact, so, no, no. The question was, who's teaching it in fourth and fifth? Uh, it's classroom Dr. McNeil teachers. says it is classroom teachers. Classroom teachers, okay. yes. That was, that was the question. Okay. But in grade I, I, K thought it was, three, I thought it was. It was. It's been taken off entirely. Right. No, I get it. Okay. So this is accurate. It's just different than what I'd heard. So I just wanted to verify that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me a little bit more about how a BCBA interacts with? a classroom teacher and a BSP in your building? Sure. So um, a BCBA typically would be thought of as a Tier 3 intervention, right? So students who have considerable behavioral, social, emotional needs um, that go beyond the needs of or beyond the capacity of a Tier 1 or a Tier 2. Um, so typically speaking, the BCBA would oversee um, as part of their consultation duties, a BSP who's working closely with a general education teacher to collect data on students in order to create mm -hmm. plans. Um, and so there's two kind of elements to our asks when it comes to the behavior piece, and I know that Julie had presented last week. Um, one concern we have is that BSPs right now don't have um, generally considerably more training than a teaching assistant when it comes to the behavioral intervention piece, and so we want to make sure that those people who are on the ground are really well equipped to work with students. Um, but the BCBA's role tends to be mostly in terms of data collection through assessment, um, behavioral observations, and then working in consultation and concert with um, general educators, special educators, the BSPs, um, and school counselors. So when you see the B BCBAs, they typically, when it comes to an IEP grid, would be indicated in the A section, which is consultation. And so... Um, they are stretched thin in terms of having to, you know, run between buildings. If there's a crisis, they're not somebody who can immediately be there to respond. Um, and the idea being that if we really want um, to have meaningful data collection processes district-wide um, that then result in meaningful behavioral interventions, we need to have the oversight and then also the training. Um, so the oversight from the BCBAs and then the training when it comes to the BSPs who are then able to actually implement it with teacher support. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's very helpful. All right, are there any other questions? All right, thank you very much for presenting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the next item is the calendar, and we wanted to approve the grade 1 through 12 start date of September 8th. Karen, we want to approve the grade 1 through 12 start date of September 8th, the February vacation starting the week of Monday, February uh, 15th, 2021, and April vacation Monday, April 19th, 2021. Mr. Hainer? On this calendar, there's also <coughs> Uh, two or I, th I think two maybe more non-school days they're dealing with uh, something else that's going on so I was wondering since that was not mentioned in what you just stated mm -hmm. the motion should we 
take note of that, and we're not approving those days at this time. Uh, correct. We're only approving the start date and the two vacations. The reason I mentioned it, they're printed on the document that we received in Novus. That's all. I just right. want to make, make it clear. We're not approving the document. Mm -hmm. right. right. Thank you. The document you. is not relevant to the motion. Thank so you. Just, just pr it just provides the dates that we want mm -hmm. for the motion. Thank you. Dr. Should we not also approve the kindergarten start date? Sure, we can. Mm -hmm. It's um, a little bit more complicated because that's just the open house date. Yeah. Okay. But, but just for families, um, our expectation is it's as is written here where it's open house date on September 8th, the ninth half of the class goes all day, 10th, the other half goes all day, and then the 11th, they all show up. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so does somebody want to put together a motion that says all that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I move to approve the start dates uh, for grades 1 through 12 and uh, kindergarten as uh, listed on the document that we were supplied with in Novus. Additionally, we're approving the February vacation date and the April vacation dates also is um, listed on these documents. Second. All right, any further discussion? Mr. Shugman? Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm certainly going to vote to approve this. Uh, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, I know there's a committee talking about calendars. I am not inclined to make any approval of any further changes to the structure within the calendar until all factors of the calendar are considered, including uh, starting before Labor Day. I do not want to mess with the holidays till we look at everything. I'm not going to do this piecemeal. So I just wanted to say in an open meeting in a public forum, uh, because this is an agenda item, to stake out my position in this sure. so it's clear going forward. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Motion passes. Thank you. Mr. Green. Yes. Can we ask that the administration put post these dates um, on the website? Oh, we will for do family? that. Okay, mm -hmm. great. We will. I mean, especially the kindergarten one because no. right. mm -hmm. people have to be planning. Mm -hmm. um, may, I, may I? Sure. We're going to be sending out information announcements about the opening of kindergarten registration and we provide that all at the very beginning we'll have it on our website we'll try to communicate as much as we possibly can but i'm just thinking of families who are often planning their vacations and they need to know that their kids going to have a little more vacation than they are i mean the kindergarten ones well we're hoping more. that they all come on september 8th Right, but mm -hmm. it's that ninth or tenth day that I mean, that September 9th or September 10th that they'll have to have mm -hmm. coverage. Right, they would have to have coverage. That's true. Yeah, if, if that's, that's true, because their child may not be in school on one of those days. They, and they the won't be in school. Significant portion mm -hmm. of September 8th too. The mm -hmm. visit is pretty quick. Yeah. The visit is quick. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. Um, but I will add. Of course, it doesn't necessarily work completely, but. The after-school program students that are in those programs um, are still eligible to be in those programs uh, beginning on the 8th. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, and just one further note. I mean, you should still continue to develop the calendar. And when right. you're ready, hopefully in the next couple months, to come back, with, with us, back to us with a draft calendar. What we have done in past years is usually in January, and we've moved it up this year because there's been some question about it, um, is to do basically this in January, probably nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. um, and then later in, in early May, come back with the other days, which are you know, the, the um, early release for the middle and the high school, as well as um, conferences to the extent that we can put them in because we're going to have to give some more thought to that uh, next year. So anything that we currently have in the calendar is all sort of brought back at that time and to Mr. Schlickman's point there you know anything that we would have as a other proposal should we have something would would be taking place during these next few months before that calendar came. 
right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Dr. Osmond, Sorry. Just going, I, I appreciate that we got this done now. Um, going forward, I don't think this is early. I think actually even going to November or earlier, mm -hmm. um, even having these dates a year ahead would be nice. Um, not, it doesn't have to be the whole calendar, but it's just the exactly. start date, the end dates, the vacations mm -hmm. um, are all helpful for plant families who have longer term plans mm -hmm. than no. many. We can, uh, we can definitely do that if we get added to the list for even in October, because I think we'll know certainly by then yeah. what, uh, what's going to happen okay. with those issues. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. All right, next up is Professional Development Day. Dr. McNeil. I'd like to wish everyone a happy holidays. Thank you. See everyone watching. Karen. The millions of viewers. Okay, so I'm here to present on our actually it's part of our district goal to increase the cultural literacy of all district staff. And this is one action that we have done annually for the past three years, is to have an all day uh, professional development day for all staff in November that is dedicated um, to cultural literacy. And this year the theme was equity and inclusion. I do wanna make one note is that in the district goal I did uh, air and putting in 10 hours of professional development and it should be it should read eight um, because after this particular day uh, the building administrators will follow up with more professional development at their uh, individual buildings so I just want to state that so um, on November 1st our professional development day today I mean this year took place on November 1st and um, in this particular presentation, I will be able to give like a description of the day, share information about staff feedback, um, and identify themes from the open responses that came from that um, survey that I sent out to staff that I do every year in order to, in order to understand how to, you know, continue to improve their experience and make sure that it's relevant to their practice. And um, give next steps regarding training for this year. And that includes the building administrators um, planning additional professional development throughout the year. So this, and, and this is based upon previous feedback. So this day, this particular, this year, uh, we actually started planning last spring. Um, and I put out an email to all staff inviting any staff member that wanted to participate in the planning to be a part of a professional development day planning team. Um, so we began to meet um, once a month to discuss and review the feedback that we got the previous year in order to understand how to make this a much more enjoyable, engaging, and relevant experience for all staff. So part of, those, part of the things that um, was highlighted in that survey was that staff wanted to have more choice they wanted to have time to work together in a building team or in their grade level teams. And um, so th we, we tried to provide that type of flexibility. And another uh, important uh, component was to also center on what's going on here in Arlington and um, provide various pieces of data to, 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 for uh, staff to reflect upon as they go throughout the day. And so I think that we were able to accomplish those three things this year. And part of that was also inviting staff members who had various things that they wanted to share and teach to their fellow colleagues uh, in a workshop format, invite those individuals to um, submit a proposal of things that they would like to facilitate. 
And I think that that went very well. And that we got a lot of positive feedback as it related to that. So we had a combination of outside speakers, um, speakers from the community, and also uh, district staff. So our keynote speaker was Dr. Liza Toulousen, um, and she was, is, has also is known to the community because she has had parent forums at Thompson and Brackett. That went very well. I actually attended both of those uh, forums that she had last year, and, uh, and, and part of the focus of those discussions was talking about, um, with parents, how to enter into a conversation about race. And I think she did that very well, and I thought that she would be, she, and, and the professional development team felt that she would be a great selection because she, she already had that um, connection with the community. And I will highlight that Allison Elmer was on the uh, professional development team as well, so she's welcome to chime in on any, any or make any comments. So um, the keynote speaker was Dr. Liza Toulousen, and then in the afternoon, uh, staff went back to their buildings and they participated in um, professional development led by either by their building administrator or an outside facilitator or someone from the district. So part of this presentation is including uh, the feedback that we that uh, that staff um, provided. Uh, so we had 317 staff respond to the survey. Um, this PowerPoint, you know, gives like some of those highlights of the feedback that we received. And however, collecting the feedback, I wasn't able to parse out the individual um, feedback for regarding the specific morning workshops. I, I can do it, but it's gonna take a lot more time because they're, the way that the data is presented is very intricate. So it's, it's gonna take a little bit more time in order to parse that out. Um, and then we're gonna use the feedback that we got this year to plan next year's district-wide professional development day. So this is just giving some statistics of who responded to the survey. Most of the individuals responding to the survey were content area teachers, and most of them were elementary. And we also wanted to see, based upon the people who responded to the survey, how long they've worked in the district. And we see that uh, the majority of the people who responded to the survey had worked in a have worked in the district zero to five years. Um, just based, based upon the demographics of our teaching force or our instructional staff and our professional, our professional staff uh, were predominantly a white district, so 285 respondents were white. And we also surveyed to see what the um, how people identified uh, gender-wise. So most of the individuals, again, this is, this is a result of, you know, the demographics of our professional staff in the district. So 272 respondents were female. So this slide shows the, how people felt about the effectiveness of uh, the message that Dr. Toulousen provided in the morning and we have an overwhelming positive response where we had 19.8% agree and 75.8% of the respondents strongly agreed. So these uh, next slides, as you can tell, the, the blue is strongly agree and the red is agree, um, the orange is disagree and the green is strongly disagree. But uh, staff responded to various prompts just to give an example the session, and this is regarding the individual morning workshops that staff uh, attended. So this is like the overall um, perspective from staff of their, ex of their experience of uh, participating in the morning workshops. So one of the prompts is I learned something new. Um, I, felt in I feel inspired to make a change as a result of this session. So all very positive, and that was pretty much the theme um, as they responded to other prompts, uh, the speaker gave an engaging presentation. The materials and the slides presented were useful. So as you can see, oops, I'm sorry. You know, as we flip through these slides, that really pretty much give an overall perspective of how uh, staff felt about their morning workshop experience is all very positive. 
Um, and then getting into the afternoon session, we had over 70% of the staff felt that it was um, productive and met the goals of our, uh, met the theme of the day, which was to focus on equity and inclusion. And then these are, and then we also had an open response, so I provided staff an opportunity to give additional comments. And these are some of the themes that came out from those comments. Um, um, some of the staff, and I didn't put this in there, but some of the positive comments were like staff who have been here for some time. Um, they said that this is the best professional development day they've participated in in their like 10 year or six year experience here in the district. So that was very, uh, it was, it was very, uh, I was very happy to hear that. Um, so some of the things that, you know, were also positive that it was a great day provided choice with a good mix of local and outside expertise. The keynote speaker was excellent. It was an excellent menu of workshops. We had over 31, like I said before. And, um, and there's, these are some of the things that we need to think about. Like we had a mix of two hour and one hour morning workshops. And so, you know, I was surprised actually to hear this and very kind of happy to hear this, that staff wanted the workshops to be longer uh, in order to get past the theoretical point that the speakers were making and get into really some of the strategies and practices they felt like they needed to, you know, have the workshop go a little bit longer so they can dive into those strategies and practices. Um, time for lunch needed to be increased, which I do agree. Um, we tried to pack a lot of things into the day and, you know, just trying to do that. We, we definitely need to give staff time. And I think not just to eat lunch, but to debrief about their morning experience and meet with one another in a very relaxed setting. So I, I, I definitely take that. And it, it was definitely very valid. And uh, also to provide, and, and I think that if we provide more time for lunch, that will take care of the next bullet, which will give staff time to debrief about their morning and, and talk with their colleagues about their experience and, and start to contemplate, like, how can I take this knowledge that I acquired in the morning and, you know, incorporate it into my practice? So I just want to acknowledge that this was a team effort. I definitely want to acknowledge uh, it always starts at the top with, you know, Dr. Bodie was very supportive and it's, you know, gave us the, the, the space and the agency in order to go about this and plan this work uh, this this day, and so it definitely could not have happened without her. And these, and then I, just a list of individuals that you know, food service, the director of food service, and the food service staff. We have bus drivers and, and the director of transportation. So I just want to just make sure that I put this in the in the presentation that you know the high school custodians, all the building principals, all the building administrative assistants. I'm sorry. Um, you know, I just want to highlight those individuals who just, it just would not have happened without them. And it was truly a collaborative effort. You know, the Deputy Director of Information Technology. Um, we had high school teachers. We also had a student voices video where we captured some of the um, experiences from the students that we presented in the morning that got, got very uh, uh, positive feedback. And the high school teachers, John D. Tommaso and David Moore were big, you know, help with you know producing that um, David Ardito the director of visual arts he also helped with that um, the high school assistant principal Bill McCarthy helped with the rooms and getting all the technology in place uh, we even had like our students Braden Quinlan and Grace Walters who was an intern to help produce the student voices video and Braden helped on the day of the professional development with the uh, you know technology and then also our professional development committee which was representative these individuals took time they were not paid they came they took time they volunteered their time to come after school and have meet participate in meetings and then do various tasks to help support the day uh, in their own personal time mm -hmm. and then um, also um, the ACMI youth coordinator Kevin Wetmore and all the staff who actually present who presented and I have a list uh, we have Hannah Dingman Thad Dingman Dr. Janger from the high school, Sarah Marie Jetty, Pam Watts Flavin, who was the director of children's services at the Robbins Library, Heather Smith, Jessica Nye, Sarah Bird, Jeannie Wall, and Rebecca Wall, Christine Capalto, Aaron Heineman, and Graham Daly, Margaret Credo Thomas, John Masuk, Kristen DeFrancisco, and James Paris, 
Brian Buck and Melanie Costendakis, uh, Kate Fractal, and then we had partnerships. And we also had some organizations who we partnered with who also helped with the presentations, Massachusetts Partnerships for Youth, uh, the IDEAS, which are the initiatives for developing equity and achievement for students, the METCO, um, Inc., and Understanding Our Differences, which is also a organization. So all in all, it was a great day. It was a, a, a very positive experience overall for most staff, which I gathered from the feedback. And uh, we're going to continue to work on this particular goal throughout the year and, you know, take that momentum forward and, and take it into next year. Mm -hmm. So that concludes my presentation, and I'll open up for questions and comments. Mr. Hainer. Thank you very much. It was excellent. Um, the amount of people that participated, what percentage of our total staff was that? Do you know offhand? You said 317. Was that the entire staff? Who responded to the survey? Yes. No. No. Okay. It was a little less than half. Okay. And I, d I noticed that th th there were a lot more women responding than men? Is well, because just d demographically, we have more women that work in the, in the district. Do offhand, would you know the percentage? Not offhand. Okay. I guess we have to look that up. That's been an issue in my. <laughs> right. um, I, don't, I don't have the exact percentages, but it, predominantly, I mean, we know. I mean, it's predominantly female. Far less than the elementary level. Am I correct? Far less male. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, mm -hmm. Dr. Alex Nampi. Um, thank you. Two questions. One, it would be helpful to see a list of some of the types right of. Here individual of presentations I can I can give this to Karen and she can provide this for you and this has a total list of yep. the workshops and the, the titles and the description of the presenters and, and an agenda in it so I brought this along so I can yep. make a copy and pass it around yeah, yeah because I know there's a lot of parents concerned about the work that the district is going, doing on this and mm -hmm. that gives us more that we can talk about absolutely um, and then the second thing is, could you flip back to the slide um, on how many years have you worked in Arlington? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to bring this one up because I thought it was very interesting in the setting of just hearing the requests for more instructional coaching mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah. Looking at the number of teachers who are zero to five years working in Arlington. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was interesting in two respects. One, I think it kind of shows where there may be some need. I understand some of these teachers may have worked somewhere else first, but from what we're hearing, I think a lot of them are coming in fairly fresh. Um, second, uh, certainly they're new to Arlington and how we're doing things. Um, second, I think in terms of recruiting for teachers, I think the fact that we have this, we're developing a robust instructional co coaching staff and, and ability to access. And I would think that if I was a new teacher looking for a job, that would make a district look more attractive if you know I can come in and it's like okay I've got somebody you know if I have any questions even if I don't I have somebody coming in there and you know they can help me get to that student who I was worried that I wasn't able to reach so that's all I wanted to say mm -hmm. just to clarify though this these are just of the people who responded right. to the survey right so I don't know how that right we I don't suspect know. it's somewhat reflective of and, and as somebody who does a lot of surveys for their job, you might, like, you, you sort of are like, oh, well, it was, like, just under 50%. That's really quite a good survey response rate for, an, a, you know, something like this. I, mm -hmm. I, that's, it, it demonstrates that people were interested and, and, you know, the survey was, you know, created in such a way that they could do it quickly. And, and you know, whenever we get, like, 50% survey response, I actually feel really good about that. So I, I don't think it's something you should be cringing about. Thank you. Oh, uh, just it sounds like a great day and that uh, people learned a lot. Um, I would just sort of emphasize what you heard from the feedback of having an opportunity to digest things and talk mm -hmm. to each other and, and sort of look if there's places in the future to sort of bring back some of the lessons to read, you know, sure. just to create opportunities for, mm -hmm. for um, teachers and staff to sort of engage with each other on these issues. Absolutely. In future times. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, I, don't. I just want to mention, um, first of all, um, Dr. McNeil did a terrific job on this day. It was really, ex it was an excellent day. I think everyone felt that they could learn something from it. Um, I think doc our keynote speaker was particularly impressive. And, and one of the things that's um, great is that she's going to be coming back to Arlington for three sessions, one in March, April, and May in the evening for parents, and of course we'll certainly invite all teachers to go to it as well. Um, but it's a great connection to have with her, and, uh, and we're even planning some more things for the, the following year. So um, I want to thank you for all that you did to, to make it as, as a great a learning day as it has been. And I think the other part of this is that when you do professional development, or, or even when you do, we were talking about literacy earlier, these are not one-off. These are just sustained, constantly providing the professional development, whether it's social-emotional learning, the work we're doing, literacy or math. You, you just have to back it all up with PD. But the challenge, of course, is the quality of the PD, mm -hmm. and then the time for the PD, and, and all of that. So we do a lot more job-embedded PD than we've done even you know five years, ten years ago. And, to, to uh, Dr. Allison Ampey's point about, you know, an attraction of coming to Arlington, we really do a lot to support new teachers. Could we do more? Yes. We have a, a very robust mentor program. So it was a great day. We'll continue doing the work and build on what we learned from feedback for next year. Absolutely. Uh, so one quick question for me. Do we have a theme for next year, or when does that get? Well, we have to convene our professional development committee, and yeah. then we'll have to. I, I think I would like to also, it, it, one thing that I think the reason why people are responding to the surveys, because they're actually seeing the changes that are being made. So since the first year I came, you know, I got the feedback, and then we incorporate those changes. And so we're continuing to evolve. Okay. And so... Part of that is also identifying the topics. Um, I would like to continue uh, with the equity and inclusion, but maybe go ahead and you know, like do a little bit more merging with SEL and seeing, like really getting into the various uh, strategies and things that teachers can do within the classroom. Great. So like really get into the instructional part. And so, but again, I'm going to send out, you know, a survey and see how we can, you know, do some testing around. And Day. I know, right? <laughs> that's that's going to be something that's going to add to a lot of stress. the complexity of it is the, you know, just and just the way that we're going in society is probably going to be a very stressful election day. So we have to make sure that we are, we, we plan around that. So yes. Great. Thank uh, you. <laughs> great job. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much. And I will pass around. Um, I can let you see. Great. <laughs> All right, Mr. Mason, you made it in time for your, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. He had capital planning yes. before yes. this meeting. Yes, sorry that, that went well. Uh, yeah, it went well, uh, very productive, but we have to, a couple more meetings before we finalize the plan. Great. Um, the next meeting is January 2nd for that. But tonight uh, I'll report not about the capital planning, but about the financial reports. This is for. Uh, the financials through November 30th um, and so as usual we have our general fund report um, this report is the the funds from the town appropriation which conclude you know monies from uh, the state uh, that is allocated through chapter 70 um, uh, with this we're projecting a, a surplus of 485,000 um, that doesn't necessarily mean it will be a surplus, uh, but it, we, there's still, uh, this is what we currently know, and there could be some unknown expenses that will hit, and as well as some plans that we may try to complete this year. Um, on, on that report, if, just if you understand that the revised budget column is the, the, the current budget with year-to-date expended 
with the encumbrances, what we're currently contractually obligated to spend out, and then some projected expenses of expenses that we know, which lead to the available budget. Um, that, that surplus is once again driven by uh, a budget, when we created that budget, uh, uh, by uh, a, you know, out of district tuition uh, balance, mainly. Um, we also have the grant financial the uh, report. Uh, it's called grant accounts on the memo, but it was we changed it to grant financial report. Uh, one thing to know: all, all things are are moving as planned. Um, through this, though, the the we did receive an additional twenty two thousand five hundred from METCO. Uh, METCO did receive additional two million dollars to support the program's transportation needs, um, and they allocated per pupil. So that's uh, what's where appropriate enough for transportation for that additional funding. And we also have the revolving fund report included. Uh, one thing to note, as when I was preparing today, I did not catch this um, error, but it's a minor error under the circuit breaker. Under the revised budget, it says 2.3 million, and then under the total revenue, it says 2.6 million, um, which Circuit breaker, how we budget for is the funds that we will receive this year, last year, we'll spend it this year. Um, and the 2.6 million is what we received, so it was an error that carried over and was not corrected. Um, so there, if you look into the projected completion, there's an actual credit balance. Mm. That is not accurate, it should be actually zero because we've encumbered all of the funds to spend what we collected last year. Any questions? Mr. Hayner? Uh, <clears throat> on the, uh, the sheet that you gave us, line 81205, student activities support stipend. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I I'll, let me begin off by telling you, I'm going to be just discussing negative numbers. I apologize. But mm -hmm. I, what is exactly is the act a support stipend? Well, those, those are for um, extracurricular activities and clubs at the high school. So I get, I'm just curious, shouldn't we know ahead of time what the programs are going to be? Correct. Okay. Um, so when developing the budget last year, there was a methodology that I used coming in so late. Um, the methodology was based on the actual data that I knew at okay. that moment, which was based on FY18. So we allocated the expenditures based on that, the expenses in FY18. Um, and uh, but kept it at level funded for those type of expense uh, budgets. And one of my favorites, uh, snow removal and ice. That's <laughs> no, not within your uh, understanding. I realize that that slips and slides. I'm just curious. We have it under one item there. It's custodial snow removal, and then later on, uh, contracted snow removal. Doesn't the town do the uh, snow removal, or are we required to do our own? I understand the sidewalks for the custodians. I understand that line item there. But I assume the contracted one are the streets aspect of it or the? The parking lots. Is that what that is? So the contracted services, we contract the services for parking lots. We do for, that independent of the town. We don't, the town does, it doesn't provide that service for us? No, not at the moment. Okay. Um, and, um, but we also, you know, we bought a new vehicle in the fleet uh, that helps with the plowing. So currently, three schools are are internal. So uh, facilities and custodial workers are participating in the snow removal. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, line 83804, athletic <clears throat> services. Is, is there a reason that that's showing a negative number? Once again, it goes back to that budget okay. technique. Thank you. <clears throat> and... But can I, I, I'll comment that, you know, uh, we'll be working. Uh, so Jose did really great work working on this report. He's the new school accountant. Um, he's been here for about two months now. And we he's caught on really fast. We're going to do some adjustments. So you won't see as many negatives in the next report. Because mm -hmm. we did do some adjustments, but for some reason it did not pull over in the period snapshot that we looked at. Okay. Under instructional materials, textbooks, computer supplies, and computer software, I assume they're going to fall under the same statement you just made. They're on the uh, begins which, with which line 85, 85103, instructional materials, 
is showing 155,000 negative, and textbooks is showing 236,000. We are actually spending 32% higher than what we spent last year at this point. So I'll review that and give you some when information. We, I'm but looking at the textbooks. I thought our goal was to go towards uh, electronic uh, books and things of that nature. Uh, are we, is this the workbooks and things of that nature? No, um, and that's a very good question. So I, in order to make sure that we have equity for all students, we buy class sets. So the class set stays in the classroom, and then you get the electronic version of the textbook so that, te that students can access it at home, but that if there is a student that does not have that type of technology or access to technology at home, they can take one of the classroom books home. I think that's great. I just want to preface it by making that statement. But so instead of alleviating the budget, it's all well, right. I, I, think, I, I, hear you. I think I think you're also seeing, and I would have to go in and itemize it, but we've also had to update our social studies right. uh, curriculum of, based upon the new standards, so that has been, and also updating our science textbooks <clears throat> at the uh, middle school level. So this would also go to the computer supplies and the software to, to keep it at... Uh, yeah. Updates and things of that right, because we have a vet, we have a process where teachers find online tools that they would like to utilize in their classroom, and so we're always evolving in that particular area. Sounds great. Last item: eighty-eight five hundred one capital equipment furniture. Is that just replacement of old stuff? Um, yes, correct. Well, it would be replacement of any uh, item that would be considered a, a capital item or furniture item. Right. So, it necessarily it may not be replacement of old things. It could be something that's new. I don't know the exact item. Well, I mean, we budgeted $4,000, and we're looking at a $59,000 expense right now. It, something must have been discovered from when we budgeted it to uh, today. Well, that partially is understanding what we spent in previous years, and that's a, a line, along the line that we, that was spent last year. So in 2018, it was minimal. And 2019, we spent about $60,000. So, so if we are in, gonna do the same, which I'm not 100% sure yet, right. um, that's what that would be. And it's usually for, like if we purchase, we have more students in the building, so we have to buy new cafeteria, cab cafeteria cables. That would come out of those lines. So setting up different classrooms, all of those okay. would be in those expenditure lines. Thank you. Yep. Ms. Seuss? Uh, one question and one point. Uh, question is about professional tech services. So it looks like we reduced the budget, but then now we're spending over. Is there something that happened, or is there <clears throat> just more needs than we expected? Can you tell me the line number, please? Yes, uh, professional 83101. I know. Um, that reduction is in the uh, was a carryover. So um, something that was spent in prior year that had the budget overstated in the original appropriation, mm -hmm. we're moving it out. It wouldn't be applicable for this year. So that's why we, it's removed. But we've, we're now spending more than budgeted, right? Well, we have a projected expense expenditures of, so, the logic behind some of the projected expenditures, if the expenses hasn't happened, some of the things are items that I know mm -hmm. that occurred, but in addition, looking at prior trends and understanding that in 19, we spent at a certain level. Right. So I'm just making the assumption that we will spend again at that level unless there's a deviation here. Okay. Um, and then the point is, I realize at some point it might be nice to see um, variance numbers percentages yeah. sort of at the end of the year maybe or something to just because I know you can sort of go down and you look at these big numbers and some are very small but but some small numbers may represent quite a big variance and so it just might be nice to see that now would you like to see the variance based on a, a percentage variance I think would be helpful it's based on what's expended against to date versus where we were last year at this time I mean that'd uh, be... to me it sort of feels like an end of the year report sort of okay. you know to that, that would be nice to see mm -hmm. that kind of. So right now, just to give you, I look at, when you ask me questions, mm -hmm. I have a different report that helps <coughs> answer for certain questions in terms of variances from where we were at last year mm -hmm. to 
to where we are at this year. Right, right. So if I look at overall, we're 0.16% above what we did last year, which is really low. I would think it would be along the line of 2%. Yeah, that's right. Um, on actuals. But then... But within categories, they might be very different. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I will take that and... I was planning on meeting with the budget subcommittee and hopefully that mm -hmm. will, we can discuss different formats yeah, of what exactly. you would like to see. Good. All right. Um, yeah, so again, this is more of a form format formatting of the report thing, mm -hmm. but one thing I am still struggling with is the general fund expenditure report relationship with, for example, the, the, um, the grant. Or, or actually with the Robbing Fund report is a better example. So if we just look at tuition at other schools, which is partially funded by the circuit breaker, right when, when, how do we know our total spending is down or up, right? Do you, do you know that now? I mean, so the $6 million that's in the general fund expenditure report. For the tuition out of district? Yes. You're referring to? So would that be six million plus the two million in the circuit breaker? Yeah, so yeah, they, we separate. So the general fund report is only the funds from general funds. If you want an all funds report, uh, that'd be something we can discuss about having that adjusted. So we can do the a report with all the funds that are related to the school. So if circuit, if Tuition in other schools is down by, say, 1.2 million, mm -hmm. which is what it's showing here. Mm -hmm. you, you've fully taken the, the 2.3, the 2.6 million in the circuit breaker, spent that, mm -hmm. and then all of the savings occurs in the general fund. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Well, because we can only carry over circuit breaker. Right. 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 No. No. That's the way. That's the right way to do that. I just want to make sure that that's the way you're doing it. Correct. Any other questions? Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Superintendent's report. Say one thing. Oh, sure. I forgot one thing. Yep. I have to give acknowledge it to my, actually, she's brand new in the district, my administrative assistant, yes. Asha Daniels, mm -hmm. who worked very hard on helping with the organization. We actually, she identified uh, with the help, with the working with Denny Conklin, a new tool we could use in order to make the choice possible for staff to sign up for the professional development day. So I just wanted to, I, I need to, I definitely needed to, uh, it would be remiss if I did not <laughs> identify her. her. It, 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 she gave. We it, definitely it, want to keep her happy. Right, <laughs> right. And so she was exceptional mm -hmm. and just coming into the district and took on this task and did a great job. So. Mm -hmm. Thank her. Thank her on behalf of all of us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right now the superintendent's report. I really don't have much tonight, um, other than except this is, is, is a very large item, and that is where we are with the high school project. Mm -hmm. um, last night, the building committee met to make final decisions on the $24.7 million gap between the de design development costs and what the budget was. Mm -hmm. So just to remind people what the process is, we went through a schematic design, and from that schematic design, a budget was developed, which is what we went to the voters with. But what happens during that process um, is that the, the, the design gets more developed, more detail, and then it goes off to cost estimators again. And when it went off to cost estimators again, they found um, a gap between our budget and what they're seeing in the market today. Uh, what's going on today in, is that we have a lot more big projects, both public and private, and the, the bigger the projects are, the, the, there's an inverse relationship that there are fewer uh, subcontractors that are available to do these more complex. So it's, it's a market force in terms of competition uh, on these. So just in the last six months to eight months, we both the, the cost estimators for our design team, our CM, CM, our contractor, as well as our OPM, because we've had cost estimators from all three look at this, and, and they did a lot. They did a lot of work to um, 
to to align their costs as well and came to a, a consensus on what the gap was. So this was a quite a long process for the committee. Um, I think in the last six weeks, the committee itself met five times, but there were a lot of other meetings that occurred that, of subcommittees of the of uh, the building committee. So it was, um, I, I have to give a lot of credit to uh, Mr. Thielman, who ran a great meeting last night, because it, it, it was a, it's a difficult thing. It's a, a, you're making some very important choices, and you, you delve into the research on these, and a lot of discussion, but on most things, we had consensus um, on, the, on the choices. So there were some hard decisions that had to be made, and um, we don't know yet whether we will have to do some more, um, some more decision making as we get to 60% documents and construction documents and whether we get to 90%. Um, it has been the experience of other projects that yes, that could happen. And so we, we, will, we will deal with it when that comes along. So, none, so right now, um, in terms, I'll, I'll talk to what was reduced, but the, our architects are going back to prepare the documents they have to submit to MSBA, which will be done sometime mid-January. But it doesn't change our timeline. We are still going to be beginning with the pre-construction um, right around the uh, February vacation. And in fact, we will have a forum to, for the community to talk about all of that um, in February. And we're sort of working on what the date is early February. Um, and then the construction is still going to start. There'll still be more work to be done on construction drawings and going out to bid and all of that. But the, the actual construction is still planned to be started next October. So in terms of um, some of the big items, you know, the, they range from millions of dollars to a particular item to $6,000. Um, and it was a big, uh, big uh, array. But one of the things that the committee felt very strongly about is maintaining uh, our commitment to sustainability, to all electric, to still moving forward on a net zero. And so there was a lot of research and discussion about what effect would happen from reducing the geothermal wells. The committee decided that we are going to have geothermal wells, it's just we're not going to have as many as we had planned, I think originally it was like 3.30, we're down to 1.33? One thirty. One thirty. But in the analysis of the savings in terms of operating costs, it, it really wasn't a big spread. So we did reduce, but we're maintaining uh, that. Uh, at, the, at the moment, we, you know, we put in the footings for the lights on the fields, but we have in the conduits, but we, the, the poles will have to wait but we did keep the turf fields in the project at this point. Um, but there were some things that, that, that had to not be in the project, and, and maybe we will vote on an alternate list later on, but such as the Minuteman bikeway or the, the east stairway, uh, east ramp, uh, which is the ramp between the school and the CVS. So there were, um, those were difficult decisions, decisions about glazing and what kind of brick we're gonna use. But the, the thing that's really important for people to know is that um, it was a very thoughtful process. Uh, there was great consensus on the committee, and the committee remains committed to the goals of the project, having an excellent facility, and we're going to have to stay within budget, and it's going to um, try to reach all of the sustainability goals that we had, um, had talked about when we were presenting this to the community. So um, I think everybody had a hard time wrestling with these. People spent hours going over spreadsheets and in discussions, but uh, that's where we are. And then we're, I think tomorrow we're gonna work on a press release uh, on this, and um, that's where we are with the project. We're still moving along. And, and the chair of the committee is here, and he may wanna add something, and, and <clears throat> Not, Dr. Allison Ampey yeah. is here too. I think, yeah, I think Kathy touched on it all. The committee, um, every member of the committee 
and, uh, and the school administration spent hours and hours and hours looking at spreadsheets, looking at the design, <coughs> uh, making sure we protect the uh, spaces for students so there, was, there were no reductions in common spaces, no redu and that was a proposal at one point in time. Mm -hmm. No reductions in common spaces, no reductions in, in the number of classrooms, no reductions in uh, places where, for, in, in programmatic uh, spaces. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, I think everybody left the meeting last night pretty tired <laughs> from the mm -hmm. process and uh, feeling like this is something we had to do. The, you know, the committee, as, as we said at the beginning of the meeting, the committee's job now is to make sure um, that uh, the project is aligned with uh, the amount of money the voters allocated for the, for the new school. And that's our job for the rest of this project is to make sure that we are within budget and we're delivering a school that meets the needs of our kids. And there are a lot of different opinions. We welcome the public's opinion, uh, you know, input, <clears throat> but there are a lot of different opinions in the group on which way to go, and we took votes, and like anything else, mm -hmm. there are majority votes. How, how did the Battle of the Bunton Burners come out? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're in there. We ever, they're, 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 well, they're, they're in there, but we're going to do some more research as to yeah, whether can we, we can do it a different way. Yeah. But we still need a flame. We just don't need the electric. We had an impassioned, right, a teacher here, very good teacher, came and gave an impassioned plea for the Bunsen burners, so they're in there. Yeah. But then there were other opinions about the burners by members of the committee from their own experiences in high school. <laughs> I just want to point out for the public when they look at the list of things and wonder why did we make some of these choices and ask about consensus, I think under it's important to understand that once certain um, choices were made, the other choices became inevitable because we couldn't afford, you know, once, you, once we made some really big choices, everything else couldn't be done because we just didn't have the money. I mean, we couldn't do that and stay in the project. So mm -hmm. there was consensus because we knew we had to meet the budget that mm -hmm. we've been set and we were respectful of that. Um, and, but I don't think anyone, there's many choices on there that we made that I don't, you know, in the best possible world, we wouldn't want to have right. made any of them. Um, but we're, we had the objective of having a quality building and uh, maintaining the educational program, and we were able to maintain, we were able to meet those objectives. But mm -hmm. I just want people to understand that it wasn't consensus that we felt like all these things, you know, it was good to get rid of them. It was just, we needed to make budget. Ms. Morgan? Well, and, and also, um, am I right in saying that we couldn't have gone to the voters with a larger budget project in the hopes of preventing making these, the way the process works is that you have to go to them with the project you have, with the amount of money mm -hmm. that that project is gonna cost. So there was no way, you know, to go, and to prevent having to go through the process that we're going through right now that unless you wanted to double your triple your contingencies which would have been hard to get through the MSBA <clears throat> they probably wouldn't have accepted it yeah. mm -hmm. even, and even if your budget was coming in under even if your estimate had come back under what your project budget was you would still have to go through this it is a required part of the MSBA process they're trying to make sure that you're analyzing everything and getting good value for your money, whether you're having to shave your money down or just look at it and go, well, do I really want, you know, do I really need this or is there a better way of doing it and saving our voters money at the end? Right. So. We have a number of things, a number of seven or eight items, I don't know what it is, as alternates right now, we have to take a formal vote on all the alternates at the January meeting, I think we probably should do that. And so then, but that, you know, so, the connection of the Minuteman bikeway, that is an alternate, and I believe there's a number of things on that list that we, that we could do at the end of the project should we have the money. Well, one of the things that's complicated in the decision on alternates is they come into two categories. Right. One, we have to prioritize, mm -hmm. and uh, the other is where you, you can go out in a different bidding process. So it's, it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. um, but to both your points, the, the educational um, functionality of the building was predominant and um, so when you have to change the type of metal you use on a facing wall or you know these are the kinds of decisions get really quite granular I have tile 
and the tile. We ha we had seven feet tile on the corridors. We moved it down to five to five feet after talking to other principals that were in construction projects. Mm -hmm. Every, every project, big project that's out there right now for high schools or even elementary are facing the same thing because it's the, the market in which we're going out mm -hmm. right now, which I don't think we, well, I don't think that it's changed so much in the last eight months that we, we couldn't have anticipated this level of change. But, you know, everybody made a, you know, a lot of research went into this to make sure that what we would be choosing would not affect the main goals of the project and certainly would have good warranties and, and qu make a quality building. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I will say, I, you know, this is a time with our last meeting of 2019 and I just want to wish um, all the, the community and the parents and our students um, most joyous holiday season and uh, Great, and wonderful wishes for next year. And I think that, you know, from the school mm -hmm. department's point of view, we leave this, this calendar year with a lot of gratitude to the community. Uh, we're able to talk about the high school project because of a June override. If you heard the elementary principals tonight, we were able to really, really change some of the important things in the elementary because of the override in June. So we, I, I I want to acknowledge that and, and to, to again say thank you for all the positives that have come to the schools this year. Yeah. Great, mm -hmm. thanks. <clears throat> Consent agenda. All mm -hmm. items listed are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless the member of the committee so requests, mm -hmm. in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant number 20114, dated 12-17-2019. Total amount 1655306.86. Approval of minutes, regular school committee minutes of 12-12-2019. Approval of trips, Naga Okakyo, also Kyoto, Osaka, Kobe, and Nara, Japan, homestay, July 4th, 2020 to July 14th, 2020. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? It's unanimous. <clears throat> okay. Um, policies B E, uh, B E D B, and K F E. Mr. Chairman, I move approval of B E on second reading. Second. Is there any discussion? This is the one that just, 19. just has 19 meetings. Yes. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Yes. yes. Any opposed or abstentions? It's unanimous. Mr. Chairman, I move policy BEDB with the amendment that I have presented in Novus, uh, adjusting the language for the 15 minute rule to include the phrase, unless the chair determines that the ske that scheduling a presentation necessary. Is there any discussion, Mr. Thielman? Um, so the, the, here are my thoughts on this. Um, I think I like the fact that you amended it, Paul, so thanks for doing that. I think the, uh, <clears throat> Two-thirds means five people when you have seven, so that's right. Seven times 0. 0.67 equals mm -hmm. yes, 4.9 or 4.69, so, 4. 4. 4. 4. so it's, you know, four if there's six people. Um, so that is, um, you know, high bar to me. Um, We're a polite group. I know, but I have, mm -hmm. I have, there was a period, we've had great chairs <laughs> in recent years, and actually most of my time on the school committee, the, chair, ever, the chairs have always been reasonable, but there was a period of time where it was a little <laughs> difficult. I wasn't and, on the committee then. I know, but <laughs> <laughs> we missed you. Um, you were the only one on the committee then. So yeah, I was. remember that. And so, I know, I know, so I'm scarred by it. But the, um, um, so, um, I, have to go back to that time because had that rule been in place, there would have been on this issue, there would have been a lot of games, um, a lot of games. I can just imagine different things happening during that time. Kathy and I were here. Um, 
So with this group, this is very reasonable, and it basically sends a message that we want our presentation to be short so we have time to talk, and the chair has to use his or her discretion, which is a good thing. But there may come a time when new people get elected to the school committee who um, you know, have an ax to grind or an agenda, and then it <clears throat> manifests itself through this rule. And I'm just going to caution everybody on that, that that's what happens. That's why we have a Policies and Procedures Committee that meets regularly. Yeah, well, that's right. But Mr. Hainer. I hear what you're saying, Mr. Feldman, and I would tend to agree, but I also realize that a majority of civilized people can change the rule at a later date if there's a problem. All right, any further discussion? Ms. Seuss? Oh, uh, just that it seems like the problem that would be created is someone asking for more time and the chair sort of being transcendent in that. It just doesn't feel that big of a deal. I mean, the person mm -hmm. still gets 15 minutes. There's still quite a lot of time to present material. So I feel like the risk is fairly modest. I say to my young staff, you haven't lived through a recession yet. <laughs> <laughs> when you do, your, your viewpoint of the world might change. Yes, Dr. Allison, yeah. I watched many of the meetings that <laughs> Mr. Thielman is talking about, and I agree that there can be issues or could be issues with the wrong mix of people. Um, and I share his concern, although I appreciate the, the changes that have been made to this. I am a little, I'm wondering about the written reports. Shall, okay, the written reports may be received, that's fine. Mm -hmm. It's the shall not be read aloud at the meeting that concerns me. Um, that what does the chair do? I mean, I know how it happens in town meeting, right? The um, you get stopped, <laughs> and I we don't have. We don't run things that way here. And I feel like it's, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm again worried that this is something that could be misused later and be held up by policy and. and Mr. Schlippen? Yeah, I, I think that in this point, presentations to the committee are done by employees of the district. Uh, almost exclusively. So we're give, we are, as the employer, giving instructions to staff of the district. So I'm sure they're going to look at this and comply. Somebody being aware of our policy and our desires isn't going to come in with 10 pages of single-spaced text and start reading it to us. Uh, I think this more provides direction and expectation than something where the chair is going to come down with the gavel, which might happen, say, in a town meeting setting. May I respond? Yes, go ahead. So I would just point out that the, meet, the presentation that we had today by the elementary school principals pretty much fit this description. And I'm not knocking it. I thought yes. it was helpful. I think when you're presenting as a group, when you have one person doing your Spoke, being your spokesman, it is your spokesperson. Um, it is easier to have something written, and so you're not going off message. So you're properly conveying the words of the group. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like having a copy of it so I can see it. It. I also like seeing PowerPoints so that mm -hmm. it can be done different ways. But I'm just I'm. So and yeah. I understand so town meeting yeah. is very different. Yeah. At, at, while I'm chair, mm -hmm. I would interpret this much more narrowly. I would interpret this much more narrowly. So a PowerPoint or a speech is not a written report. Mm -hmm. okay. Just because it's put in novice doesn't mean it's a written report. Okay. That's how I would interpret it. If there was a written report, if there was, you know, and we've seen some of them sometimes, um, and they were reading the whole thing, okay. that's what I would mm -hmm. interrupt somebody. But these types of things that are basically just their speech that's mm -hmm put into a report mm -hmm. that's, that's, cut, that's written down mm -hmm. and put into Novus because they gave it to Karen, that I wouldn't consider to be a written report. Okay. But that's just we, me. Another chair might interpret it differently. You're right, we, there's a, there is a risk of that. Yeah, we have considered those reports when we talk about evaluation materials and stuff. I mean, they, they count as a report out, um, so. It's not a, pre we're not making a presentation. We're doing a, 
legally prescribed uh, uh, task of the committee in which we're required to state read only the words that are in the evaluation document in that case so obviously state law trumps policy and in this case it's not even a report no I'm, I meant that when we're asking for evaluation material you know when as objectives we mm -hmm. say we want to report on something and a lot of times it can be something that was pretty similar to the elementary school principals thing I mean that's the report I, I, th I think that Look, at, you know, nobody who's been a chair when I've been on the committee, obviously, uh, I was off for five years on a nice little vacation during stormy times, but uh, I, I've not known a chair who's unreasonable in terms of uh, folks coming before us. What we're trying to do is have people uh, presenting professionally to us. Uh, there are times when you need to read text because it's important but uh, I, I think best practices would call for a visual uh, and uh, so, uh, and a more rehearsed presentation not for the most part I don't disagree with that mr. Hainer I'm just concerned we're, we're worrying about yesterday going forward I, I have faith in this committee I'm a mm -hmm. talker try to limit it and occasionally I'll get a look at a look from the current chair and previous chairs and get the message so mm -hmm. I think it's uh, I think it's worth going trying it worth trying it yeah I mean I don't anticipate people raising a point of order at the 15 minute mark if no. the chair didn't notice or the same thing if somebody's reading a presentation I don't or mm -hmm. or somebody came with a terrible PowerPoint I don't anticipate somebody raising a point of order and challenging that you know <laughs> there may be a future member that does that and we may need to reconsider it but. all right any further discussion okay all those in favor aye, aye. any opposed aye any abstentions I mean, I've seen. opposed is no not aye. no no I no i <laughs> <laughs> no. that karen one out of respect, one out of one of respect for those who serve with me during that period <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move uh, pile, uh, file KF-E, uh, fee structure for rental school buildings for second read and adoption. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? That one's unanimous. Okay. Subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Alton Ampey. We will be meeting on uh, January 9th at 8.30. Uh, policies and procedures, Mr. Schlickman. Um, we just uh, adopted the policies. Great. Curriculum, instruction, assessment, accountability, Ms. Morgan. Uh, we need to meet in the new year to um, tackle mm -hmm. the um, SOA plan. Mm -hmm. So who, who needs to be I have no SOA plan, mm -hmm. obviously. <laughs> so, who do who can I ask who who do we need who do we need to kind of corral mm -hmm. to get going on that? Well, I would prefer that you wait a bit because we are tackling it. Great. In fact, we've even talked about it, and it's a whole administrative team is on it. So, what we were thinking is that we would be working on it. Um, Probably January, early February, and then you know, involve giving you our draft. We'll go through a couple of sessions, bring it to the you know, your committee, bring it to the school committee. It's due April first. Okay. So, so let's we'll we will meet at some point in the new year mm -hmm. to talk about the SOA plan. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you can meet to go over that schedule in a little bit more detail. Yes, sure. Um, mm -hmm. And not have any draft or any. Yeah. Framework for the plan, but maybe yeah. just go over it because mm -hmm. it's a very tight schedule. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. Um, We're going to put some more meetings in as a result. Uh, not your committee, our uh, community relations, Ms. Seuss? I need to do a, go a doodle for okay. mid January, I think. Facilities, Mr. Hainer. Uh, only to report that uh, we'll be meet I'll be meeting with I and Possibly, my other member will be meeting with the PTO at Dallin on January 28th at 7 p.m. Great. Uh, legal services, nothing. Building committee, we covered. Calendar committee, anything? 
Yes. Um, so we met with the community um, on when was that? On the 11th, um, about 50 people showed up. Uh, we some small group discussions and uh, sort of shifted the process a little bit midstream, and then uh, brought out people sort of to larger discussions, uh, larger points people wanted to make. Uh, we also received about a hundred notes, is that about the right number, from, from parents in the community, um, indicating their thoughts and their preferences. Um, and then the calendar committee met on the 18th to sort of digest all this. And we sort of looked at, at all around here was all the um, you know, big pieces of paper that people had written on. Uh, we discussed the comments we received. We only started looking at some of the comments that were written on email. Basically, I think to do this right, we need more time. <laughs> we also discussed how we could reach out to groups in the community um, representing religions and cultures that we don't, we didn't, haven't heard from yet, just to hear more about what their concerns were. Um, and the current thinking is that we will come back to the school committee with a recommendation April something, I mean some spring. Uh, it may not be implemented next year, maybe the recommendation is we wait a year, but, but sort of the idea is um, we just need more time. But we are looking only this year at religious holidays and also hopefully the look of the, that's gonna be one meeting basically at the time of the look of, of the calendar. Um, any discussion about where, when we start has been deferred to next year. So that is not being discussed right now this year. There's not gonna, you know, the spring recommendation will not recommend anything about mm -hmm. start time um, before or after Labor Day. So that's where we are now. Calendar format. Format, yeah, I, yeah, so I, I sort of, yeah. Tried to say that, but mm -hmm. I may have said it poorly. Yeah. So again, just to you know, my perspective is, if we're going to change the start date, we need to give parents a year's notice. Mm -hmm. So we need to know <laughs> by September of 2020 if that's what we're going to do. So we can't defer it to start discussing it in September 2020. May I? It, the start date is a contractual issue. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be into the negotiations next year. A contract would not be ratified probably till May, so it would actually be two years out. Right. Um, we would not be looking at a change next year or the following year because of just the whole process of negotiations. Okay, so that, that, that's fine, but you you'd also said that there are some teachers that are upset about ending on June 28th, 9th, 29th, 20th. the following year, it would be June 28th. So there is, if that is the sentiment, there is an opportunity to have a side conversation with the union, make mm -hmm. that yes. one change. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be tied to everything else. We're not going to pay them more for starting on Monday instead it, of it's Wednesday. It's not a small discussion. <laughs> what, what, if I may. Well, the, the law allows impact bargaining on an issue uh, of concern. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it, it's, it's, I would recommend, because it isn't something that's going to be settled in five minutes or ten minutes, that if we're going to do this, we should do it as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. That's all. I mean, I don't know that we want to do it, but I'm saying some teachers have told people that they want to do it. Some parents have said they'd be open to it. Um, some parents are opposed to it. So, I, again, it's a big issue. But I don't see just putting it off until the year that it doesn't really matter that much. This is, these are the two painful years. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Ethanandji. I was just going to point out that we don't know if the community wants us right. to yes. do it. Yes, I right. understand. And that that's, mm -hmm. it's a contractual issue. And we have a process where we go through negotiations. And there was discussion mm -hmm. with the union about um, what we want to do prior to negotiations, and uh, the we have the we have the uh, second vice president mm -hmm. of the uh, of the AEA here. I want to just say something along this. All I can say is that we're happy to discuss this in negotiations next year. We are not interested in reopening the contract before that. Okay, okay. that's the message we got. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> All right, there we go. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. One other thing, I just want to point out that in 2021, 
Rosh Hashanah begins at sundown on Monday, September 6. So if we are open on Rosh Hashanah, we are having our first day of school on Rosh Hashanah, which I think is the, is a terrible message. We did it one year, and to have families having to make the choice between religious observation and going to school on the first day, I think is not the direction I want to, I want the district to go in. In 2020, um, Rosh Hashanah starts on a sundown on Friday, so it, we only have one uh, of the high holidays in the 2020, and in 2023, uh, Rosh Hashanah is on, it begins on a Friday night. So, uh, you, you know, the, the impacts differ across years, but I certainly would not want to be open on September 7th, 2021. Okay. Mm -hmm. Election Modernization Committee, anything new? Uh, well, we did meet recently, um, and we will do on the 17th uh, to discuss warrant articles put for, before uh, town meeting. Uh, there will be a couple, one potentially on um, uh, changing the way town meeting members are elected to make it so that people with the most vote get the longer terms. Um, that may or may not be contentious, we'll see. There might be a ranked choice voting on the warrant. And um, there'll be something to ask to, I've talked to this last time, to extend the time to do this committee and change the, some of the membership and some of the, and the voting requirements and stuff like that. So, some Great. exciting discussions. Mm -hmm. Superintendent search process, Mr. Shipman. Uh, we had a meeting at five o'clock this afternoon mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Kucher, the executive director of MASC, came to talk to us. Uh, the item of interest that was the focus of our discussion was very specific. Hello, Mr. Mason, I'm about to go and use your name here, so <laughs> bear in mind that something is going to be thrown at you. <laughs> I just wanted to give you warning. You were just looking too happy over there. Um, we talked about the, the type of things that need to be in an RFP um, and what our desires were. And Mr. Kucher said that the things that you want to put into an RFP are facilitation of focus groups, analysis of feedback, online surveys, uh, develop decision criteria, position descriptions appropriate to the community, um, and that our uh, timeline to be most advantageous, which is what we're trying to do anyway, is to open the search on Labor Day and close in October. He said that's the best way to get a, the, the highest quality candidates. Now, um, we looked at, uh, previously we distributed some RFPs from other districts and Brookline uh, was an example for two reasons. One, the discussion of what they wanted from the search firm was good in the opinion of Mr. Kucher. However, it had a very negative component as well in terms of the hoops in the RFP. He said the requests for documentation were onerous at the point that nobody wanted to respond to the RFP because it would have taken him four days of work assembling the documentation for all, all the requirements. So uh, that would provide some information as where, uh, as where to go. Um, that we would like to have a draft RFP by the 13th of January and on a motion by, uh, and a motion uh, approved by the committee uh, the chair has been asked to draft a message to Michael Mason or his designee telling him what we would like to include in the RFP and, and uh, get an initial draft RFP uh, so the subcommittee can look at it by January 13th. Uh, and that is the report of the Superintendent Search Process Committee. Great. Thank you. Uh, liaison reports or announcements. Liaison reports or announcements. Nope. Future agenda items. Um, so you had 
asked a bit about, or you? Oh, about it. I mean, it asked a bit about inclusion, about in, special yeah. education. Yeah, special education. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the budget. Mm -hmm. And I had asked Dr. Bodie also about the lab inclusion report re recommendations and any budget impact. I was hoping to get a report on that before we do the budget in February. So that's still something yeah, that we can look sense. into. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right. Uh, disband Legal Services Subcommittee. We had discussed we don't need that anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Uh, I mentioned this to the chair uh, since I've uh, consistently been saying uh, nothing to report. I don't, I'm, and I'm asking the body this would we prefer the word suspend? as opposed to disband, I don't know if it's going to take anything to put it back or whatever. Yeah, it's yeah. not one of our, I think, standing subcommittees. So it would disappear policies. anyway. So yeah. Yeah. I moved to I moved to disband the Legal Services Subcommittee, effective. Second. Uh, any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Unanimous. And are there any executive session? Nothing. Okay. All right, motion to adjourn. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. Have a nice holiday, everyone. Happy holidays. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy. All right.